What's going on, everybody? Welcome back to episode 55 of the Textual Talk. I'm your host, HD. And today we got a different episode. Um, I've been wanting to try something new out with the platform. And so, but first and foremost, if you're listening on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, or any other streaming platform, please make sure that you follow the podcast and leave us a rating. It really does help with our analytics and algorithm and it helps spread this awesome message out to everyone that wants to hear it. Today's episode is a little different. Instead of me doing like my normal story time, it's going to be to the latter part of this video. I'm actually going to cover some current events that I've been following for a while. So we'll be touching on quiet quitting because all the rave right now is about quiet quitting. And so uh, I found a video that we're going to react to for that one. Patreon laid off everybody on the security team. That's one I definitely want to look into because I use Patreon and I also work in cybersecurity. So if you're going to do that to them, I'm a little upset and I may just take my talents elsewhere. Also, we have uh, a Los Angeles school system. They got hit with ransomware, so we're going to check them out. And last but not least, Microsoft has this fast track to get people into cybersecurity and earn six figures. So we're going to talk about that. So yeah, without further ado, let's get into our video. So like I said, there's been a lot of rave about quiet quitting. And I think for the most part, quiet quitting has to do with like just setting your boundaries and doing your job and going home. But we know, depending on what type of employee you are, that you can't necessarily do that. So without further ado, let's get into the video. This is one example of quiet quitting, a trend that has been dominating social media and especially TikTok. In July, Zaid Khan, a 24-year-old engineer from New York, posted a video about quiet quitting, and it went viral. Since then, the trend has spread like wildfire with hashtags like quiet quitting, quitting, and quieting. Does anybody want to work anymore? Then the mainstream media began covering it. Like working overtime? No thanks. Late night emails, ignore those. Quiet quitting is a really bad idea. If you're a quiet quitter, you're not working for me. The world is changing and the way of work is changing. Even people saying, I'm not going back to the office. And if I do, I'm definitely quiet quitting until I find a job that is a lot more flexible. All right. Uh, so briefly to talk about what you kind of saw in the beginning is, like I said, in the beginning part of the video Seems like a conversation, well, a make believe conversation of someone saying, Hey, I'm not going to check anything at the five since I'm off. And then you see all these different clips about asking who wants to work. And you just hear this woman uh, talking about uh, going in back into the office, right? So, being that I'm in cybersecurity and most of the things that's been on this, talked about in this podcast revolve around cybersecurity. Cybersecurity could technically be a quiet quitting role, but not really. It depends on your function. Like if you're higher up, like you're a manager, most of the time, okay, yeah, quiet quitting. However, any event that an incident is, you know, is happening or like a breach or major news, like uh, everyone knows about, you know, Live 4J, Live 4 Shell, things of that nature that happen in your company, all hands are on deck. So you can't tell somebody, oh, uh, I come in to work at seven. Uh, I'll check it then. No, because if you don't check it then, you might not have a job to come back to. So I would say about quiet quitting, it really depends on the type of job you do. I would say that. So let's let this video roll a little bit more. I'm not going to try to do all the video, uh, but we shall see. COVID was the ultimate reset. COVID was that moment where people started to ask a bigger question. What do I want for my life? Do I want to continue working the way that I have? Or do I want something different? Do I want to continue to work, which is awesome, but do I also want to be able to enjoy my family? Do I also want to be able to enjoy my life? So I think all of these things are coming in stages. And I think quiet quitting is just the trend that's come as a result of the ultimate reset, which is COVID. Something like 40% of workers are now saying they plan to change jobs this year. The pandemic also triggered the great resignation people, but um, they're really running scared. Millions of Americans quit their jobs in 2021, some for better opportunities, some for a career break. The pace of quitting continued well into 2022. This chart tracks job openings and labor turnover in the U.S. economy. 
jolts for sure. We do think that quiet quitting is part of the great resignation story. So it fits into to the general story of uh, having a high level of quits for the past uh, year, year and a half, and certainly a very tight labor market. And in that type of a labor market, it makes a lot of sense that workers may not be willing to, to work as hard as they have in the past because it's. So let's kind of break a little bit is now uh, they want to start off talking about COVID 2020. Uh, so a lot of employees found out that, hey, you're disposable when it came to COVID. Like a lot of things transpired where people were furloughed and some people never got those jobs back. And they realized, OK, I was really killing myself for this job. And based on, you know, other factors, I don't have it anymore. Or you found out, hey, I need to do a job to where I don't need to interact with people. Therefore, I can make sure I always have a way to feed my family. So that's one of the ways where they can talk about the great resignation. As we know, a lot of people are trying to get into tech right now uh, because it's hot. Yes, it's needed for you. Is the reasons right? I don't really care as long as the people know how to do their job. But that's that's kind of part of it. It's like people want to be able to take care of their families. You know, you saw that when it came to all those different, uh, whatever those checks were that people got, stimulus checks. Some people were taking a haircut uh, when it came to getting those checks and they weren't able to take care of their family. And so they looked at those jobs and said, okay, I'm going to come back, but I need to get into something else. Like, I can't do this. And most of all, the biggest thing is, and this piggybacks to what, the woman said in the beginning, when it comes to forcing employers back in the office, yet people are still getting sick from the same uh, virus that's proven to be deadly. That's when people really woke up and said, OK, I'm going to choose myself first because you don't care about me. You just why do you want me to be in the office if I don't have to be in it? That's the biggest question. Oh, we need you to collaborate. People have been doing just fine. Matter of fact, productivity has actually went up since people have been working remote. You know why? I don't have to go to bed super early so I can get up super early to commute 30, 40 minutes and then be stuck in traffic about an hour, hour and a half going home, then eat dinner, then hopefully be able to do something with the family, then go to sleep early. No, people want more of their time back. And remote work enables more flexibility for, you know, if you have kids, uh, lifestyle, and you get a little bit more of your sleep back. You know, if you got more, uh, more rested employee, you have a better outcome. But that's just how I feel. But let's let it keep going, and then we'll probably get into something else. It's very easy to get alternative employment. So the question is, what is quiet quitting? Quiet quitting is referring to a situation where employees are making a choice to not necessarily go above and beyond what they're being asked to do. It doesn't mean that they're not doing their job. They're just not going above and beyond. Back in my day, it was called coasting. For me, my last time quiet quitting was five years ago. I used to be in tech sales. What I did was work less. I wasn't putting in the 40 hours anymore. I wasn't giving in to the drama anymore. I wasn't giving into work gossip anymore. I wasn't answering emails or texts or Slack messages, you know, DMs after the work day. I just want to comment on that. And that's more so called a little bit of uh, disconnecting from your role. Not necessarily quiet quitting. That's, I think that's a little bit different. It could mean that you've gotten tired of where you're at and other things are, you know, going on in the environment and it's made you really disconnect from everyone and just really want to go to work and come home. So, I mean, I guess you can put it on a quiet quitting, but I would just say it's its own different situation because I've did that before. I've disconnected. It is where it's like, I'm just here, but it's whatever. So I, I've definitely been there before. Uh, let's see, we're three minutes in. Uh, let's get a little bit more of this popping real quick. Days, so weekends were free. They were mine. Even though it's millennials and Gen Zers who are actively talking about it on social media, quiet quitting has been happening amongst Gen Xers, which I'm part of the Gen Xers, for the better part of two to three years. The anti-work movement is not a new trend. 
In 2021, the lying flat or Tang Ping movement took off in China. Many viewed it as an anti-work phenomenon. This is a labor protest movement in China against the country's relentless work culture. Some argue that quiet quitting is similar to the lying flat movement. In the US, quiet quitting could also be a backlash to hustle culture, the 24-7 startup grind popularized by figures like Gary Vee and others. I think it is almost direct resistance and disruption of hustle culture, honestly. And I think it's exciting that more people are doing it. When it comes to hustle culture and quiet quitting, we're seeing from Gen Zers especially that they're really focused on ensuring that they have that work-life balance and really mission-driven purpose when it comes to work. And we see this across millennials as well. People are being more honest about the fact that they just don't want to give beyond the 40 hours of work that they normally would get because they're tired. There has been a... So I totally agree. Um, everybody is not meant for the, the hustle culture. That's why the people who are, are the top, you know, 1%, top 5% in the country simply because of their work rate. It's very hard to do. It's very hard to sustain the family. That's why most people hustle first and then try to build their family afterwards. Uh, more, you know, useful when a man does it. It doesn't really, you know, work that well for women. I'm just playing. I'm just playing. No, I'm really not. But I said that to say that I think millennials and and I don't even know what the cut, the age starts for Gen Z. I'm just confused at this point right now because like I forget where millennials start. I'm born in '92, so I am a millennial. But we are more intentional with what we want to do. Um. So the biggest issue though is that they say we don't. You just want to have 40 hours. Most jobs, unless depending on where you stay, but most jobs don't really give you a salary that lets you comfortably work 40 hours and not have to do anything else on the side unless you have two incomes. Now, if you have a two income household, it's very different. Your buying options are, you know, different, but we know with inflation that's been killing people is like the salary's not going up at the same rate. So a lot of Gen Zers, a lot of millennials are, pretty much trying to get a higher paying job that will allow them to have more work life balance. And that could be hustle culture in itself. Cause you have to do that in the beginning. You really have to grind to get a job that really would pay you a lot. And, and these jobs, people are, you know, trying to find jobs upwards of like the hundred, like if you got a base salary, like upwards of 150 K plus, you know, more to just have a life to where, okay, I can just work and come home. I can invest. I'm going to take my family on family vacations and I don't have to do nothing else. It's hard to do on a, on just the salary alone. I mean, if you look at the housing prices, they're still kind of high, but they're coming down. You know, you go back what five years, 10 years from now, everything is a little bit more accurate. So they got to adjust those problems, right? I mean, address those, not just talk about, Oh, people want to quit and all this other stuff. Yeah, people stressed out because they can't afford to live in a way that not makes them have to work all the time. Bars. But all uh, right, I said we're gonna we're gonna do it till five minutes. So it's like forty seconds left. Let's let's check it out. A tsunami of job resignations. In twenty twenty one, the Great Resignation dominated the economic news cycle. Want or need to remain in their roles. So, in the second quarter of the same year, U.S. productivity data posted its biggest ever annual drop. And some economists blame workers leaving jobs or not trying hard at their current jobs for the hit to productivity. Quiet quitting is probably part of the reason for the slowing in labor productivity. It's hard to tell uh, from aggregate data exactly why. Labor productivity is, has slowed so much over the course of the pandemic, but uh, it is certainly one of the reasons that you would expect to be weighing on uh, labor productivity right now. All right, so we're going to cut it right there, but think about it. Are they talking about like working class labor people? Of course it's going to drop. People worried about dying, y'all making them work harder in a pandemic and not paying them more. Why, why, why wouldn't they? People was probably straight up quitting and say, I'll do something else. And I don't have the data to, to prove that. And maybe one day I'll research past this and, and address this for quiet quitting. But 
I just thought that was interesting. And then putting my spin when it comes to cybersecurity is the fact that if you are looking to get into cybersecurity, quiet quitting is not necessarily going to be an option for you. Now, I'm not saying to always make yourself available 24-7, but just know that sometimes you will work out of the confines of a normal nine to five. And as long as you understand that, you'll be okay. Because some jobs, you know, rotating on call or, you know, you might have a night shift team or they're contacting you. At, for the whole week because you're on call. I did it all. So let's go ahead and get to the next one. If you're watching on YouTube, you know what to do, man. Go ahead and please hit the like button, subscribe, share it out for the YouTube algorithm. And if you're still listening on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, and Google Podcasts, I appreciate you. But let's go. Patreon fires entire security team. Professionals in the IT and cybersecurity world have raised their eyebrow at the Patreon, quietly fired their entire security team this week. The news came following a LinkedIn post from a former Patreon security team member on September 8th. So for better or worse, I and the rest of the Patreon security team are no longer with the company, Emily Metcalf wrote. As a result, I'm looking for a new security or privacy engineering role and will appreciate any connections, advice, or job opportunities from the folks in my network open to work let's see fortunately Metcalf's post was met with sympathy and support of several security professionals across the tech industry offering support and employment opportunities from companies like Fortinet Discord Blue Origin and Comcast among others that will probably do a little to serve the nerves of patrons over 6 million patrons and hundreds of thousands of creators whom the company handles financial transactions for Security System News reached out to Patreon for clarification shortly after the news broke about what had precipitated the shakeup and whether it could be linked to a more problematic issue like a company hack or data breach. Okay, let's see what Patreon has to say about this. To answer your question, this was not in response to any incident, but I can confirm we let go of five employees who worked in security operations. Patreon's interim head of communications and U.S. policy lead Ellen Satterwhite wrote in correspondence. As a global platform, we always prioritize security of our creators and customers' data. As part of a strategic shift of a portion of our security program, we have parted ways with five employees. We also partner with a number of external organizations to consent, continuously develop our security capabilities and conduct regularly security assessments to ensure we meet or exceed the highest industry standards. And... Okay, so that's probably about the end of that. Let me go big. All right, so my brief thoughts on that is that's kind of what I was thinking. Normally, if a company, first of all, they said five members of the team. So I'm wondering if they have an internal team and they have external teams that they use because that's very prevalent in organizations. It might be too expensive for them to staff a very big internal security team. So they outsource to different companies. That's kind of like, what I did at one of my previous companies where we had clients, we were at MSS. So that's one of the things I was thinking is like, hmm, maybe they're not saying not too worried because they have external security firms that are doing the monitoring and everything else for their company. Now, it'd be interesting to see if there actually was an incident. Um, we do know that the economy has forced for layoffs and other things. So to try to cut back they probably said you know they could do without that and uh, listen corporate like i just told y'all in my last video about like almost get like getting laid off and how i realized i had to take care of myself uh corporations will look at themselves to protect themselves more than you the other companies that they get security from probably say hey we can secure y'all like for nothing like it'll be nothing for us to secure y'all so let us do it right and so Unfortunately, those people are on the short end of the stick. Hopefully, those five employees got a good severance and they, you know, get back on their feet pretty fast. Cause it sucks. Like no people, like think about it. The people that say like they did a horrible job, they just got laid off. Like, I'm gonna try to stay up to date with this and I may bring it up on another episode, but I just felt like that was interesting. It's like one of the biggest things that happened. Like um uh, but last week, yeah, on Twitter actually I seen it pop. They was like, well. A patron just laid off their whole security team. And then I finally saw on LinkedIn that same post that was referenced in the article. And I was like, man, that sucks. I'm like, I'll use Patreon, you know, because I want the people that uh, subscribe to me. And right now, 
if you're watching right now so far so good on patreon go ahead and subscribe to patreon i got all types of tiers you get different perks when you are enrolled in the patreon that you don't normally get as your typical youtube listener or subscriber or a follower of the podcast so i'm just throwing that out there but It's just a weird time right here, man. Take care of yourself. If you can jump ship and get as much money, mu- as much money as you can, do that because today's price is not yesterday's price and vice versa. You never know when the market may reset and you can't get these prices people been throwing out there. That's the thing. They really been throwing out like some some nice prices. I think I want to wa- talk about the We're going to talk about the Microsoft thing and then talk about the ransomware. So Let's get into it. Microsoft builds fast track to six figure cybersecurity jobs at more than 180 colleges. Dope. The largest, tech, the largest technology companies in the world have a vested interest in addressing the global cybersecurity talent shortage. By 2025, there will be 3.5 million cybersecurity jobs open globally, a 350% increase over eight years, according to Cybersecurity Ventures. And Microsoft is intent on closing this gap. All right. So I just want to know where they're getting these numbers from because I know so many people that I coach and people on LinkedIn that's trying to get a cybersecurity job, but they can't get hired. So where are these millions of jobs open if the people who want to get them are studying jobs? This is something that really needs a lot of breaking down and studying. I It's a conspiracy theory, but I don't think it's 3.5 million. I think... They throw this out here because it gets people to go spend money on different trainings and courses and everything like that in hopes to get one of these roles. Now, it's a lot of roles out, but I don't know if it's 3.5 million out. And now, if I'm wrong, I'll just be wrong. But that's kind of what I believe. The high demand for cybersecurity experts is reflected by the salaries. For these roles in the U.S., Microsoft estimated that in 2021, the country had 464,200 unfilled positions that require cybersecurity skills, and the average salary for these jobs is $105,800. Some estimates for cybersecurity worker salaries are even higher. Companies like Booz Allen Hamilton report the annual earnings of entry-level cybersecurity employees to be around $150,000. Okay. Now, you've heard this term that there's really not like um, entry-level cybersecurity roles. Well, most of the time, it's kind of true. However, $150,000 for an entry-level role is unheard of. I would like to see, is this all base or is this total compensation? Because then that's different because maybe Booz Allen is paying $120,000, but now they get a a $30,000 annual bonus or whatever something like that i could see that being a little bit more realistic than just saying hey i'm gonna give you 150 because you think about it there's some people that's been doing this for a while that they don't even make hundred and fifty thousand dollars a year in cybersecurity. so i would really like to challenge that and really look into the data of, of really seeing is that what they're actually paying them and what type of cybersecurity roles are they actually entry level? So there might be something else when I actually do an article, maybe on Booz Allen. Maybe I'll react to it like on 60 seconds or something in TikTok. But let's move along real quick. Despite steep demand and six figure salaries, only 3% of US bachelor's degree holders have cybersecurity related skills. Cybersecurity Ventures reports the skills gap is what Microsoft is hoping to change by honing in on a lack of diversity in the computing and cybersecurity fields. Among cybersecurity specialist jobs, 83% of these roles are held by men and 72.6% by white people. So, I, if you haven't seen my blog on uh, diversity and cybersecurity, and I just did a short about why we need it, this is why I was saying how I was feeling doing a lot of those interviews earlier on or the mid part of my career, kind of really still being unsure and just not really seeing a lot of friendly faces. That's why it could be quite intimidating just because or, or just, you know, not doing your best. You kind of just nervous. You don't feel welcome sometime. But like I said, that's more so when you're early in your career. Now, none of that matters to me. Uh, 
like I said, I, my resume speaks for itself. The things I've accomplished speaks for itself. So that doesn't really matter. But back then, and you're starting out, it could it could be really you know just different. Let's let's keep on going through the article. What's included in Microsoft Cybersecurity Skills Initiative? In 2021, Microsoft launched its Cybersecurity Skills Initiative, which included the company giving 150 million to federal, state, and local governments to support upgrading government agency cyber protection and committing to spend 20 billion on advancing their security solutions over the next five years. The initiative also includes a large-scale effort to support cybersecurity education. Microsoft is collaborating with 181 community colleges across 44 states in an attempt to provide accessible pathways into the profession. The tech company launched a campaign to recruit 250,000 people into the cybersecurity workforce by offering a free cybersecurity curriculum to all U.S. public co- U.S. public community colleges, providing training for college faculty and offering financial support to 25,000 students. Microsoft declined to provide the full list of partnering schools of fortune. Now, if you are wanting to get into cybersecurity right now, and listen, I have a younger brother right now. Shout out to him. He's at undergrad at uh, LA Tech. But I did want him to go to community college first because of things like this. Community college tends to have a little bit more benefits than a, a university. They offer certs and now you have programs like Microsoft. But I would say try to uh, community college that you're interested in. Ask them, hey, do you got a cybersecurity program? Hey, are y'all um, involved with that program with Microsoft? If not, maybe they can reach out to Microsoft and get involved. And you see that they're financing it so you can actually probably get paid to go to school and not have to pay little to anything. And you'll have a good career eventually. I ain't going to say it's going to just make you have a good career. You got to put the work in. But the fact that stuff like this is out now is is really great. I don't have I don't like the gatekeep. So definitely do not sleep on community colleges when you have this good information out here. Let's keep going. Um, let's see. Cybersecurity is going to be a huge growth industry. All right. Uh, let's get this one. Why it's important to break stereotypes in cybersecurity. St. Lucia, we have found that the more targeted we can really be, especially for undeserved populations, the better. Previously, we launched a global tech skilling initiative at the start of COVID. We far exceeded our goal of reaching 25 million people. And when we start looking underneath the hood of that initiative, we found that some roles are popping and cybersecurity was one of those. There are lots of different kinds of jobs in cybersecurity from analysts all the way up to people that create the technology. It's also a diverse set of roles. After we realized that this is a big opportunity to upskill talent and find roles for undeserved individuals, I mean underserved, I'm sorry, individuals to be successful, we went out and spoke with several community colleges and asked them if the students were interested, and if so, what were the barriers to producing more cybersecurity talent? And we found out that students are very interested. The barriers include lack of access to update curriculums, limited bandwidth from faculty and students themselves often need financial assistance to pursue these programs. Listen, in my blog article about diversity and cybersecurity, I think one of the main things I said was access and exposure. I didn't know about this stuff really until probably the end part of me getting out of college. There are other schools where kids learn about this stuff in elementary school. You see how that go? You see how if you got more exposure early on, if you do go to college and the university, your freshman year, you probably got you an internship in cybersecurity versus a person who didn't know know anything at all and is trying to work to catch back up after even being out of school. Why you have that knowledge gap or why you have all these roles open. Uh, That's one of the things that access. And you know, truth be told, like most of the black people, you know, in certain cities don't have computers at home. They got cell phones, but it's still not the same as having an actual computer. It's just things you can't do on the phone that you need to be able to do on a computer. Let me keep reading a little bit more. There's a lot of stereotyping of computer science professionals, and I think a lot of the diversity issue in cybersecurity and computer science has to do with those stereotypes. Once I asked a leader from a community college about what kinds of people are really good at cybersecurity, and he said to me, honestly, 
anyone who is curious and loves problem solving when you frame it like that that's a lot of types of people right many people could say that they love a good mystery or a good puzzle so i think that we need to break those stereotypes which is why i'm really proud that we started our work with community colleges because it is a system that's very robust across the u.s and that system has a lot of women and lots of students of color if we can really tap that infrastructure to start getting that message out that's a good start to diversifying the pipeline i, I agree with that you no know, 100 i think i think it's dope that that's what they're doing trying to get more of us involved in cybersecurity. now whether it's you know a write-off or they really want to help i don't care get your skills get your experience any by any means kevin gay style like do what you gotta do and it'll pay off and that's it i ain't gonna be trying to do too much and and tell you all these other things but let's cover the last one with the with the ransomware in los angeles let's get to it hackers target la school district with ransomware with more than four hundred thousand students ranging from kindergarten to 12th grade the los angeles unified school district is one of the largest school districts in the u.s on september 6th the district became the latest to be targeted by ransomware. In a statement published online, the district administrator said it had detected unusual activity within its network, saying it had been targeted by ransomware. Despite the attacks, students have been able to attend school. The attack prompted a large response from officials within the FBI and Department of Homeland and Security. Assisting local law enforcement, students and staff have lost access to their email systems, local reporters say. It is also unclear, according to the reports, whether students' information, including disciplinary records and assessments, were assessed by the attackers. The school district says students and employees must reset their passwords to their school, school accounts while physically attending school district sites. The district has staggered passwords resets access to minimize congestion from simultaneous users accessing the website. The Vice Society Ransomware Group has claimed responsibility for the attack following the incident. The Cybersecurity and Infrastructure Security Agency, CISA, and other partners published a warning about Vice Society, saying it has been disproportionately targeting the education sector. The Los Angeles attack is the latest against educational institutions, according to a report by security firm Sophos. Based on a survey of 499 respondents, 56% of lower education and 64% of higher education organizations were hit by ransomware in the past year a considerable increase from the previous year all right now as you talk about ransomware that's one of those things where i've always talked about like hospitals and things like education systems uh state government city government those are probably like some of the most susceptible things to ransomware because they don't have the money or manpower to protect their data like they should but what's about to happen is I think the, the government has been putting this money aside to try to get all these cybersecurity individuals as well. But what's going to happen is they're going to put money aside and try to bring in and try to. So let me slow down. Do, 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 do. <laughs> That's my own little rewind sound. The reason why they really can't compete is because they can't compete with the private sector of companies that pay more money than what they pay. Like if you notice, if you go do a city job and like I say, a city state, whatever you want to do with the comes to school or or a city job, state job, the range is going to be on there. And so that range isn't better than what you'll go get at another company where, hey, you may get a sign on bonus, an annual bonus, uh, stock options and a base salary that's higher. You can't compete with that. You just got to hope you get some workers that, you know, believe in. What they're doing is helping out, you know, the educational system, which it is. But like I said earlier, when it comes to you having to provide for your family and, and get food and buy a house and want to re retire and all these other things, those are a big factor. So that's some of the reasons why they can't attract that talent because they're like, hmm, I want to work remote. A lot of those um, city jobs and school jobs don't allow you to work remote. Or I, if I'm wrong and you work for the city, in a capacity like a it type of job please let me know in the comments and i'll apologize if i'm wrong but yeah a lot of them don't really have like uh remote positions so a lot of people now are trying to do remote positions like i said they want to be at the house they want to 
you know, wake up, put a t-shirt on, have the under on, finish their work, go take a nap, go work out, go watch a movie, go get they <laughs> they nails done. But I I think I saw an article. I'll probably check out it tomorrow about like um, what's the updates with this ransomware attack. It looks like it's not too bad right now from what we just read that you know everybody they can't access their stuff but they just got to reset their passwords but it's safe to assume that somebody's probably still in the environment so i wonder who they're gonna hire for a starting firm to actually come in and really audit everything and figure out you know the rca when it's the first time they actually got into the environment and then they probably can they probably try to write some rules around it but they just don't have the manpower i don't know what type of tools they're using or what you know, now when it comes to colleges, they're a little bit more prepared because that's a little bit more money into the the learning environment because people are paying to go to school there. So that's why you don't see a lot of colleges hit on there. But trust me, if they could, they would. But these hackers, hey, listen, check this out. Y'all not hitting what y'all need to. Y'all got all this sophistication, but y'all want to hack student loans and wrap everybody balance down to zero. That's what y'all need to do why y'all haven't did that yet i'm pretty sure people would pay y'all money on the side to do it i'm they like hey you ain't get this from me you know what i'm saying but uh yeah so this has been like the new layout and i think it's pretty cool it's gonna only get better as i bring in co-hosts and we really talk about everything together but the the tail end of this episode is gonna be briefly like my role when i worked the optive and yeah i'm name dropping because they're on my you know many pretty many, plenty of times they're already on my youtube channel but it just be brief uh i touched a little bit on that sock role and i was going to touch on like so when i worked there i started in june of 2018 and i was finishing up grad school i started off doing a night shift which worked out for me because like i said i got to do work and the one thing that you can learn about doing night shift is you can learn how much day shift is messing up. So free game. When I got there working nights, normally people just come to nights to coast alone. Not me. I was sending emails to everybody. So by the time they got an email, they seen an email from this night guy, number emails, number emails, number emails. So my management and the client management started noticing like, man, who this guy, we need this guy because when you get to a place, and I'm doing this now. I'm 90 days in on this new role. When you get to a new place, you're a new face. And a lot of times you call out stuff that people that's been there for years don't really see because they're so used to looking at it. And so you ask a question like, hey, why are we doing this? This don't really make that much sense to me. Like, why are we doing that? And then they get to look and say, you know what? You're right. I think we make them all work on ourselves. So I was always offering up, you know, process improvement, especially when it came to like use cases or uh, correlation searches that weren't making sense to me or even something not working with the sim environment. So I was able to do all those things by the time I think we used to change schedules probably like every quarter. So right before I think I graduated it was when they said, hey, we moving you to days because we need you on days. Uh so I was back on days. I was took a little bit of adjustment. Like I'm not gonna lie, it took me to about like, probably about maybe last year or two years ago to actually start like sleeping normal. Because from 20, 2014 on up to that time, my sleep schedule was horrible. I did so many different shifts when I worked at help desk that it just kept on messing my sleep up even past when I wasn't doing help desk anymore. So uh once i got past that everything was good um i got the let me see what else i do right after i think i graduated beginning of the year i got to go see the client um in california that's not really telling too much so yeah i've been seeing a client in california had a good time there um even before that i was getting told hey man you know they're thinking about probably making you like a lead and that was a thing man I've said this many a times, but the reason why I have so many good memories from that company is the fact it was the first time I got to start with everybody at the same starting line. And I got to see, hey, if I get the same 
uh, outcomes, the same beginnings as everybody else. Where will my hard work and dedication take me? And I got to see that for myself. And that's a beautiful feeling that a lot of people don't get to see in their career because most of the time we go somewhere else and now we're trying to work up to pass everybody. And sometimes due to politics, we can never do it. But when you get to start like that off, like in your in your career, like later on in your career, like mid of your career, it does a lot. It, it really did do a lot for how I thought about myself and knew what I brought, knew what my value was because they would always let me know of whoever I was talking to. Like, you know, he's doing great. I always had good reviews every time. Graduation was de- December 2018. It was dope. Had a great night that night. Um, has, hey, I had, listen, December, what was it? I graduated December 1st. Yeah, December 1st, 2018, I graduated. Uh, that's the the night of the first Tyson Fury and uh, Deontay Wilder fight. I might try to put... Uh, the Snapchat video right here where I'm yelling like it's a draw. I had some like some of the best lemon pepper wings I ever had that night. That's because I was also um, intoxicated somewhat. But the wings was hitting though. I hadn't really had wings like that in a while. But uh, all in all, like I'm just trying to leave with like, man, remember the good times, the bad times don't always last. They come and they go, but you know, it's how you respond to them. And if you respond to them in a good way, they can't hold you down. But that's just what I believe. What do y'all believe? If you dealt with some bad times, good times, you know, leave it in the comments. What do you think about some of the things that we talked about in the video? How do you feel about quiet quitting, uh, Patreon? How do you feel about this Microsoft fast track? You know, if you know, if you feel it anyway, by the light, like, leave comments down below. Let's get the conversation started. I'm definitely just going to try to bring in more of these recent events in just to kind of, you know, get a little bit more involvement and try to talk about stuff that's actually affecting us. And so we can probably see some of the changes coming a mile away. So that's why I want to stay recent also on my tech podcast and just talk about some relevant things outside of the, the guest interviews and some of the stuff I'll be doing with my story time stuff. But I'm going to definitely still always do my story time. But I uh, appreciate y'all for tuning in. Leave a review. Share this out with your friends or your coworkers. If you want to be on the podcast, reach out to me. We can work that out. I'll review your experience and we'll go from there. But like I always say, let's stay sexual. It's your boy HD and I'm out.